So brothers, I want to thank you for gathering today uh, as part of our continued pre-chapter process. What we're doing today and over these next few months, I think is really critical for uh, our pre-chapter work to really help us in our discernment and in our movement uh, in preparation for the chapter. Today's program has three parts. First of all, a reflection on the description of the charism. Secondly, a process for personal reflection on the description that will also include the question as to whether or not you accept the description of the charism or if there are some other ways that you would, uh, other elements you'd like to see in the description that would be more acceptable to you. And finally, a process for you to begin to articulate those practices or exercises you think would be of value for us to incorporate into our lives if we are to live out the description more fully and more intentionally in all areas of the congregation. So let us begin, first of all, with our opening prayer. Brothers, through this reflection on our description of the charism, I hope that each of us can deepen in our understanding of and appreciation for the charism of Theodore James Riken, God's self-gift of passion and compassion for creation given to Riken, which is his charism, his unique gift and his way of manifesting God's passion and compassion for the world. I do this reflection with the advantage that many of you have already spent a considerable, considerable amount of time personally and in small groups reflecting on this description of the charism and on Riken spirituality. As you listen to this reflection, you can call upon the insights you've already gained as well as see where the Spirit grants you new or deeper insights or inspirations or perhaps even the conviction to put those insights into practice. Hopefully by now you all have a copy of the description of the charism so that you can follow along with me as I quote from this description, both the general preamble as well as the description as lived by the brothers. In the preamble we read, we Zverian brothers, associates, and collaborators are a true religious family striving to fulfill the spiritual aspirations that Theodore James Riken had for his congregation. It seems to me from the outset this reminds us that Riken's charism is dynamic, not static. We are all still striving to fulfill the spiritual aspirations of our founder that were not fully realized. In doing so, we also acknowledge the reality that Riken's charism is shared by men and women who have not been called to the consecrated life, but who find in Riken's charism and in the Zaverian way something that resonates with them and invites them into a deeper relationship with God and with the brothers. This was affirmed at the 26th general chapter and was exper experienced by those present for this year's International Assembly in Bruges. Following the path of our founder, we are called to live ordinary lives that gives witness to God's unconditional love. We believe that the Zaverian calling is a way of being put in our place in the world, a place of humility and simplicity from, from which we receive the grace to turn toward God, fall in love with God, and put ourselves in God's service as followers of Jesus Christ. In this statement, we also acknowledge that the origin of Riken's charism is a spiritual one. It was not born from a desire to serve or to do good, but rather has its origin in Riken's own desire to be in relationship with God. It comes from his own conversion experience, where through the experience of his deep humiliation, what we now understand as being powerfully put in his place, he came to discover some insight into what we would call today his true self. For him, as for most of us, I suspect, this was a time when he felt most certain of his call. When in discovering his place, he also discovered a certain sense of contentment. Have you had moments like this where, despite the personal turmoil you may be going through, 
Despite the anxieties you may have, you experience a sense of contentment that perhaps brings you a certain sense of peace. Where illusions of who you are and what the world is fades away and for a moment you experience happiness or peace. The spiritual writer Frederick Buechner reminds us that the place where God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place where God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meets. I believe that Riken's experience may be similar to what Buchner describes. In finding his place, he found his contentment. As you may know, I recently came back from visiting our brothers in Kenya. I had the opportunity to spend a few days in Lodwar with Brother Louis Kalmel. I know some of you have been to Lodwar. Many of you have seen pictures of this town in the desert. Whenever I spend time with Louis in Lodwar, I get the sense that get the sense of someone who is very content. Now, those of you who know Louis know how relative that can be. Uh, it doesn't mean that life is easy for him. It doesn't mean that uh, things come easy. But being in Lodwar has given Louis a sense of deep gladness while he is also in touch with the deep hunger of the people. Louis can go on at length about the uh, corrupt politicians, about the ineffective government, about thieves and charlatans. But when you ask him, Louis, why do you stay? His response is, I stay for the people. And you can almost experience that sense of contentment that comes with him just expressing that line. I'm sure you can think of other brothers for whom you could say they have experienced the same sense of contentment. Surely Brother Peter Kelly knew that from his experience living among the undocumented in Williamsburg and Brooklyn. I can think of young brothers I've met with as they've been coming towards the end of their novitiate, hearing them talk about the deep contentment of what they've discovered about themselves, about their gifts, about their relationship with God, about their desire for service. This sense of contentment, this sense of rightness helps to move these young brothers to that stage where they're actually ready to profess first vows. For Riken, this sense of place, this sense of calling and vocation was the experience of seeing clearly with true humility, not a humility that says I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough, but rather a humility that knows our humanness, that says I am not God. It is from this place of humility that Riken is able to turn toward God, fall in love with God, and place himself in service to God's kingdom, a kingdom announced by Jesus and a way of being in the world modeled by Jesus. Brother Joe Polika, in the reflection he gave at the International Assembly speaks beautifully about the spiritual significance of place and I encourage you to go back and look at what Joe wrote or spoke about at the assembly. Being put in our place, I believe, gives us an experience of our smallness, but also of our uniqueness. I'm reminded of a quote by the author William Faulkner in his short story, The Bear, which in those days when I was teaching sophomore English, I had the privilege to always teach Faulkner. In this short story, Faulkner is talking about a little boy who's gone out hunting for the first time with his uh, father and, and others and encounters the bear for the first time but isn't able to shoot the bear because a little dog gets in the way. And Faulkner in the short story talks about this little dog, this nameless mongrel and many fathered, grown yet weighing less than six pounds, saying as if to itself, I can't be dangerous because there's nothing much smaller than I am. I can't be fierce because they would call it just a noise. I can't be humble because I'm already too close to the ground to genuflect. I can't be proud because I would not be near enough to it for anyone to know who was casting the shadow. And I don't even know that I'm not going to heaven because they've already decided that I don't possess an immortal soul. So while I can be as brave, but it's all right 
I can be that, even if they still call it just noise. I think the experience that Faulkner writes about, that experience of knowing our smallness, but also our uniqueness, which enables us to be brave, to be who God calls us to be, I think it's that sense of place, that sense of true humility, knowing that I am not God, but inspired by God's Spirit. I think it's from that place that I truly understand my own potential, my giftedness, and freely offer that to others. The preamble to the description does set out a way for us as followers of Riken, influenced perhaps unconsciously by a mystical tradition that is rooted in the spirituality of the ordinary and suited for laymen and women. This thought is echoed in the description of the charism as lived by the brothers. Right away we are reminded that we are consecrated laymen, that the way for us is not the way of sacramental priesthood, nor is it the way of the married man or the single person. It is a separate and distinct way that needs to be recognized and celebrated, but not exalted as better than or less than any other. It needs to be recognized and celebrated because I truly believe that our world and our church needs the example of men who follow this way as distinct, but not better or worse than any other way. It is a way that must be rooted, experienced, lived, deeply grounded in a life of prayer, in relationship with God, infused with contemplation, in a true contemplation where, where we are privileged to see clearly as God sees. In these experiences, we are freed of all of our illusions, our fantasies, our unconscious motivations, and see the world more clearly, no longer as a world that fulfills my needs and desires, but as part of God's plan and design. In this, we achieve a certain union or communion with God, with our brothers and sisters, with creation. Our fundamental principles remind us, it is this communion with the living God which is at the heart of your life as Son of the Father, disciple of Jesus, witness of His Spirit, quickened member of His body, and brother to the world. Communion with God leads to relationship to others and to service. For us who follow the Zivarian way, we are motivated by the lofty purpose proposed for the congregation by our Founder. We set as our life direction the non-dichotomized life of Martha and Mary. Like Mary in the presence of Jesus, we choose the better part by turning toward and falling in love with God. Like Martha, we are transformed by that love and impelled to place ourselves in the humble service to Jesus through our service to others. To live the non-dichotomized life is to live our life in such a way that despite how active we may be, how engaged we may be in service, we always have access to a place of silence and solitude, what spiritual writers and mystics describe as an inner room to which we can find nourishment, gain perspective, maintain a level of equanimity in the midst of whatever else engages us. The description goes on to remind us that the Zaverian way is a way lived in community. We aspire to realize our founder's vision of a band of brothers who mutually help, encourage, and edify one another, and who work together. We endeavor to integrate prayer and contemplation with growth and friendship within the community by means of honest and fraternal dialogue. Riken knew and insisted that the way for him and his brothers had to be in community. He rejected the thought of being that independent lay missionary. He knew that was not his gift, not the way for him, for him, community was not simply a place of common living. It was a way of perfection, a way of continual formation, centered on the word and worship of God and a sharing in the mystery of Christ. I don't know if you've had a chance to view the short interviews with the third-year postulants that have been posted on the livingthecharism.com site, but I hope that you do. Even though we're talking with young men new to the life, one of the things that strikes me is how they discover community as a way of perfection. They would probably never use that term, but if you listen to their story and their formation experience, you hear how it is in community that they discover who they are. It is in community that they experience a liberation and a freedom never before imagined. 
Listen to these reflections by Peter Wonga, Stephen Cyprian, Maurice Bunda, and Philip. While there is a certain innocence to their reflections, there is a certain hope that what they are discovering about themselves, about our Zavarian way, and about God's movement in their lives and in the world, can sustain them and help them and us to grow in a way of perfection, a way of continual formation that we find in our life in common. Theodore Riken was given the insight that it was in community that he could discover his gifts and help his brothers to discover their giftedness. In community, we are encouraged to discover our gifts and talents and to affirm the giftedness of our brothers, calling each other to greater service of the Lord. It is also in the context of community, centered on the word and worship of God, that we find the grace and support to embrace the ascetical practices of poverty, consecrated celibacy, and obedience for the sake of the kingdom. Here, I believe it's important to understand the context from which the statement finds its origin. It's found in the discussion of the community and the evangelical councils and the working papers on Zavarian spirituality, and I believe it's a footnote at the, the end of the document that you have in front of you. And I quote from that. The Zavarian expression of the life of the evangelical councils has always included a consciousness of living ordinary lives in common. Our sense of poverty inspires us to live ordinary lives, appreciative and grateful for the gifts of creation with a consciousness of living with less rather than more so as to share in the prodigality of God's love. The gift you have received, give as a gift. It challenges us to care for the gift that we hold in common and to carefully confront any movement toward preoccupation with possessiveness and autonomy. Our spirit of consecrated celibacy calls us to live as brothers to one another in community as well as to all those with whom we come in touch. This fraternal love invites us to appreciate the fundamental uniqueness of each person and to challenge any movement toward exclusivity manipulation or possessiveness. It calls us to attend to the lessons that are taught in the experience of solitude and aloneness and to the formative influence that comes the challenges, joys, and sufferings that constitute a life lived in common. The spirit of obedience invites us to listen attentively to the directives that arise in the course of our ordinary everyday lives, some within our own consciousness, some as a result of our interactions with others, and some that emerge from the situations that we encounter and from the world in which we live. The same spirit of obedience invites us to appraise these directives, both individually and communally, and to let these appraisals guide us toward decisions and actions that will promote and serve the life and mission of the congregation. The mission and ministry of the Zurian Brothers have always been directed toward ordinary people. We continually face the challenge of finding ways to have our life in common, and not so much our talents and resources, be the witness to the gospel that we offer to serve to those we serve. To live in solidarity and availability among those we serve, we need to live ordinary lives that share in the common elements of life, the gifts and limitations, gracefulness and sinfulness. We need to actually live as brothers in order to give an authentic witness to those whom we serve. It is in community that we give witness as a group to the divine, to the transcendent, to the gospel. If we do not practice this kind of community, we will become what our founder feared, a miserable association of schoolmasters. Another aspect of being intrinsically communal is that our work, our ministry is communal. I think an aspect of our charism that we are not yet tapping is a discernment of our common direction. What distinguishes our work is that it is ours, not mine. It's also inseparable from our life together. I think of my own experience as a young boy growing up in Malden, down the street from where the brothers used to live before the new school was built. Even though I knew the, the brothers and knew some of them by name, the experience I had and that I think many people in the parish had was that those were the brothers. As we would see brothers walking to or from school, we didn't see them so much as individuals, 
but as a group, as a community, uh, that really gave witness to something that was very different from the witness we saw in the priests or even in the sisters. This sense of the brothers, their availability, their commonness, uh, but also the fact that they, had, they were engaged in this common work, which was far more than just teaching, but was actually a way of being and interacting with people that made the brothers distinct from others. For us, especially as consecrated religious, the description reminds us we live in communion with the Roman Catholic Church, recognizing that our place in the church is on the margin, in solidarity and availability among the people, freely renouncing any sense of power or prestige and witnessing to the ideals of the first gospel community. This section of the description found its origin in part in our charism study and the 10 coordinates of religious life we discussed at that time. In particular, in the coordinate on ecclesiality, which is further explained and studied in the section of the working papers called Zverian Ecclesiality. I really think that this requires further reflection and discernment for us. We know that historically for Riken, he both valued the autonomy of being a recognized religious congregation in the church but also valued the sense of being in service to the mission of the church. I think we need to plumb the depths of what this means for us today. How do we both live in service to the church, but also through our charismatic identity, give witness to a way of life and a way of being in the world that is not hierarchical or that witnesses to and helps create church in its deepest sense as communal? Again, I think historically our lived experience, especially in places like Congo, Kenya, Bolivia, Haiti, and now South Sudan, in so many ways our brothers there were a witness to a more basic sense of church and gospel community, one that perhaps was more basic and less institutional. They did this while at the same time being recognized as part of the church. Again, I believe we have a long way to go to articulate and describe what this means for us today, not just in the U.S. and Europe, but in the church as it is experienced in developing countries. Finally, the description tells us that our way is the way of the missionary. We are sent as missionaries to the world to participate in the church's mission of evangelization. Like Theodore Riken, we believe that the best way to bring out the giftedness and an individual is through education. But we realize that education takes many forms. We see our way of life as being intimately connected with our mission. We believe that it is through our life of gospel witness, lived in community, that we respond to God's summons to manifest God's care and compassionate love to the people of the world in these times. We are called to live our mission on the frontiers whether those frontiers are on the outskirts of society among the poor and marginalized, or at the center among those who are separated and estranged from their own uniqueness. Impassioned with the spirit-driven apostolic zeal, following the example of our patron Francis Zaffier, we stand ready to leave the familiar and the comfortable, to go throughout the world to teach all peoples. This description of our missionary character invites us to reflect on what it means for us to be part of the church's mission of evangelization. It further invites us to a reflection on our ministry, particularly our ministry as educators. Riken himself reminds us, with his emphasis on uniqueness and giftedness, that education is crucial to discovering one's giftedness so that those gifts can be put in use of the building up of the kingdom of God. This part of the description reminds us that what we do and who we are are intimately related. It also invites us to consider what our call to mission is today. It reminds us that historically we lived our mission on the frontiers. That has meant the frontiers of America as well as on the frontiers of other mission lands. I think it invites us to consider how we are called to be missionaries, evangelizers, not only in the quote-unquote mission territories, but how we are called to be missionaries today in America, in Europe, in the West. Finally, we are invited to reflect once again on the significance of being Zaverian, looking to Francis Xavier and all he stood for as a person who was driven with apostolic zeal, driven to spread the gospel, but did that not so much by baptizing, 
but by ministering to the downtrodden, the sick, the cast off of society, while at the same time engaging those in authority and interacting with the teachers and philosophers he encountered. There's so much more we could say about this description of the charism, but at this time we'll take a break and give you the opportunity for some personal reflection. As I do that, I want to remind you that at this stage the description is not intended as final and ultimate, but that it will continue to develop over time. So please don't feel that everything must be included at this point and for all time. Rather, as you reflect on the description of the charism uh, and think about your acceptance of this description or not, um, don't feel like you need to um, see this as a, in a final stage. So first of all, during this period of personal reflection, I'm going to ask that you take at least a half hour of quiet time going off to your room or to a quiet place where you can sit with the document, read through it slowly, marking any words or phrases in the description that stand out for you. As you do that, ask yourself what is significant for you about those passages. Spend some time praying with those passages, listening to what you hear in them. Then after you've had an opportunity to do that, Ask yourself, can I accept this description of the Zverin charism? If not, what needs to be added or changed to make this a more acceptable description for you? Again, remember, we're not trying to fine-tune the description at this point, but really, does this characterize or capture for you a description of the Zverin way for you? After you've had an opportunity to do this, in quiet reflection, I'm going to ask you to come back either into a large group or depending upon your situation in some small groups to discuss, first of all, as specifically as possible, your reasons for accepting or not accepting the description. What are those things that, that you really like about the document that you accept, or if you can't accept it, to be as specific as possible about some of those things that you see as problematic. Then share what insights into our charism and into your unique sharing of the charism did you gain from your reading of the description. Spend at least a half hour in your small group or in, in the large group sharing. Then I'm going to ask you to take another period of quiet time, either after a break or uh, depending upon your situation again, to think about the elucidation of some practices with your personal reflection and the group sharing as a context. Reflect on the charism description in light of the practices you believe it suggests for the following areas of our life, in terms of our community and spirituality, in terms of ministry at all stages of our lives, in terms of our call to simplicity of life, in terms of finance, in terms of the practice of evangelical poverty and self-sustainability, in terms of the general level and regional level governance structures that support our life and mission, and then what practices can we incorporate in terms of our Zaverian associates, both for us but also uh, as the associates themselves uh, develop some of the practices they believe help them to follow the Zaverian way. In each of these categories, and you'll, you'll see some specific examples on the slides, I'd like you to write one or two practices for each area. Um, for each suggested practice, uh, please make reference to a specific statement from the description that in your mind gives rise to the practice. So, for example, in community and spirituality, uh, the, the line, we endeavor to integrate prayer and contemplation with growth and friendship within the community by means of honest and fraternal dialogue. This could be implemented by the following practice. Those brothers living in community should gather weekly to reflect on the scriptures or other scriptural texts and to consider together the direction and quality of their shared life. Those brothers who do not live in community would gather with other brothers or associates on a regular basis to share their living out of the Zverin charism. Under ministry, an example of a practice tied to the, the line, we see our way of life as being inti intimately connected with our mission. This could be implemented by the following practices, and you'll see those on the slide. 
At least twice a year, each community or group of brothers and associates shall meet to discern the nature and quality of their hospitable sharing with others of their communal lives. Or, brothers and associates shall undertake a congregation-wide discussion of the communal nature of our mission and ministries and shall work toward a more deeply shared and common direction and work. So finally, as I conclude my part of today's program, I want to thank you for your participation. I also want to ask for your continued prayers and support as we go through this period of preparation for chapter. I also encourage you to be engaged both in further gatherings like this, but also in what we're trying to do online through livingthecharism.com, as well as the other ways that we're trying to engage the brothers internationally in our preparation for chapter. Thank you, and may God's Spirit guide us in these days and months ahead.